Yes. Hello, and we're back. Uh, Christian Sagovsky is going to share some clips uh, from the upcoming Seed and Sand. We have them loaded up. We will uh, upload this separately onto YouTube for people who just want to see this. Um, so we are ready to go. Do you want to set us up with what we're going to look at first? Yes, I want you guys to hear the voices of the creatures. So the first creatures that uh, you should be, uh, it's sharing that, right? You can see? Yes. Okay, so the first creatures, these are a couple of the nest dwellers. And the voices are by Carrie Jacobson and my dog decided this is a perfect time to bark. Um, normally a very quiet animal. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit play and you can hear these little voices. Oops. Oh no. <laughs> it worked just fine just moments ago. Okay. <laughs> okay, damn. Oh, pardon my brain. I was okay. Well, I'm gonna have to just click that there. So oh good the dog didn't bark during the during the actual actual show. So the they these are the voices. There are six of these characters and they all have very similar voices, though there there there's very subtle variations that, that you can hear in them. And then the next slide I would like to share with you is this. Now this is one of the three antlered ones. They are they're not true villains in this uh, in this film, but they definitely do kind of get in the way of the of the the object of the primary objective of the main characters, which are the nest dwellers. So this is the voice of Susie Gardner of the band L7, uh, doing her her best monster voice. And <laughs> that one, the nice polite dog. Um, so there are a lot of variations in the uh, in the growling, but they're all they're all very monstery voices, and she loves doing the monstery voices, and we love to have her do the monstery voices, and it's a lot of fun. And the 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 final voice actor that I want to share with you. Oops. Now this is the sea monster, and this is voiced by Jeton Damone, um, uh, the uh, best known for being a part of Christian Death. Those uh, she's not on that band anymore, but in the, the in their heyday, she was one of the members. And yeah, hopefully, this is the actual video. Oh, here's the actual video. Here we go. <laughs> Ah, that's a uh, charming, a charming. One. <laughs> there you have. Reminds me very much of Yoko Ono's singing. <laughs> oh, and and I totally no, I totally remember Yayo Yayo Kusama because now you're not asking me the name of the person <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's just like right there. Yeah. So when if this is part two, when you were watching the before, Yayo Kusama, Yayo Kusama, and I'm butchering the pronunciation, but just back in my head. Okay, well anyway. Uh so she works uh, most mostly in sculpture, right? Sculpture yeah, and yeah, and it's all everything has to have polka dots on it. But uh okay. That's 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 the way my brain works. Uh and then I could just sit here and show you things all day if you want to see them, but <laughs> well, let's the first one, um, the nest dwellers, that was um, um, a human doing the bird whistles, correct? That you told us about. Yes, it's, it's she's it Carrie kind of whistles through her teeth a little bit. It just this, it, it's wonderful to watch her do it because it's not, it's not altered. It's the way. I mean, it's it's you know sweetened and all the like lovely things that that sound people do to it, but it, it, it is as it sounds directly from her, from her mouth. Um, 
So early on, uh, I, I, I had someone who tried to create the sounds with a whistle and or a, a, I think a recorder, some kind of like a small, small, they're still called recorders when they're little. And I just, I just wasn't happy because you could hear the breath of the, of the, the person just kind of like breathing in. I was like, this just isn't right. It needs to. And so Carrie, we, we were friends, you know, we've been friends for a long time. Um, and uh, she said, well, I, you know, I love Latin red string and I, if there's anything you need, you know, sound wise, I would love to, to help you out with seeing the sand. And I, I you know, I, I hear from a lot of people who, who contact me and they're like, do you need a musician? And I'm just like, well, um, no. So with her, I think I loved her band, the Dagons. And um, so I said, but I, but like, I didn't see how that fit with my movie, but I was like, well, you know what I really need is someone who can whistle like a bird. And oh, this was all, this was on email. So, so she read the email and, and, and I'm, I'm told, you know, after the fact, that she's like, oh my God, uh, because um, nobody know, really knows, she never really tells people that her father trained her to whistle like a bird. So it's just like, just magically the perfect, the perfect collaborator here for this. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. uh, uh, so I guess this is just kind of an observation, but it sounds like a bunch of musicians from bands uh, volunteered to do. Um, is that is? Do you think it for some reason it just appeals to people who are musically inclined, or is it just a coincidence? Well, um, these the the connection with Susie Susie and Carrie are good friends, and um, and uh, and Jatan and Carrie are also good friends. Carrie has like <laughs> opened a lot of doors and. Um, Shatan's a fan of Blood, Tea, and Red String, and so when asked if she was interested in, in being a sea monster, she was very excited about it, and um, I don't remember if Susie already knew about Blood, Tea, and Red String at the time, but once introduced to my work, you know, like, oh, yes, yes, I want to do, I want to do that, and she also does other, Susie also does other um, voice, uh, some voices for animation, um, I cannot remember the, the main piece that she showed me but some some great stuff that uh, people could look up if, if they wanted to know so so yeah that, that's kind of how, how they came to, into the project is is Car Carrie is the composer also not just the voice she's a composer so she's also gathering you know the sound the sound people I guess that was going to be my next question because I think in the third clip we heard a little bit of music uh into Dill music uh on there and i was going to ask who the who does the music for the the movie if it's already scored yeah uh, carrie jacobson is it is in progress to be scored um when i when i received the guggenheim fellowship back in 2019 um the funds from that allowed me to to get to pay carrie to start composing the music she was already involved in the project but i was more like well we can put you put you on a payment plan um, let's figure out like, you know, because I have, I have a Patreon and, and, and I do have some funds from that, but it's like, okay, well, I could do this much for this many months. And when, like, <laughs> when I got the Google, I was like, okay, I just want to secure your services and let's like make as many of the sound, the, the, much of the music as we can. And there's still, so we're about halfway through with the music. Um, we're, we're already through the funds. <laughs> we got through those, but, um. So we're halfway through through the music, and then I think she she went through the the animatic and worked out like how many songs we still need, and I forget what it what the number was, but it is just it's like both a very exciting and a little daunting. Um, so we are we are just you know working it out and working through it, and she's gonna. I I got a a, a small uh, faculty development grant from my. From my from Kansas City Art Institute where I teach and and I to apply towards having Carrie make another song, so that's kind of helpful because there's a lot of people that really you know you know they would be happy to work on my movie except for that they you know they need to um, take the paying jobs and <laughs> but I would I I I have, I plan to be able to be one of those paying jobs in the near future and bring gather everyone around me to get this finished what 
so speaking of getting this finished, is it, what can uh, I know you have a lot of fans who have been pro following the project for a long time. Uh, anybody new? Is there anything they can do to help you? Well, um, I still have the Patreon. If they if they want to want to join Patreon and give give a little bit monthly. I mean, if you imagine that. Let's see what is the Bloody and Red String Instagram? I think we're at a hundred. We're getting close to one hundred and seventy-two thousand fans on there. So, I mean, can you imagine if like each one of those people gave like two or three dollars? But you know, people, it's 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 a it's a big pull to get people on Patreon. So, you know, I, I don't know, but we it, we we've got it, and it 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 is really helpful. Um, if you if you know any producers who are looking for a project to fund you know the uh, like serious not you know sure but um we are we are working towards towards that brian do you have any uh questions uh left in your i did have one question uh just about influences and also um the symbolism in your work i was interested in asking about the artist frida carlo uh, because she also features a lot of um, images of disembowelment, of tearing, of injury to the female form. And that seems to be an aspect of your work that is very prominent. So, um, Yeah, well, I haven't had an injury as dramatic as hers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, so when I first started at San Francisco Art Institute, um, I, I as uh, many female artists do, is paint, paint it myself, and I was talking to my instructor, and I was like, "Well, I'm starting to feel like odd, you know, just painting myself," and I feel inspired to do so, and and then said, "Well, it, it," and he kind of told me the history of it, and and that that you know. He, you know that that's that that is a, a thing and he introduced me to Frida Kahlo who you know her most um, most of her artistic output is paintings of herself and you know I read her biography and we had uh, the San Francisco Institute had a big mural by Diego Rivera in there and, and the, so they covered it up I don't know why, but of course the San Francisco Institute is defunct now anyway <laughs> my alma mater is no more um uh, and for so, those who don't know, Diego Rivera is her husband, or was her husband at the time, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, so, yeah, I read, I read that and was really just, just loved her work. And um, at the time, it was, you know, her face wasn't plastered across, you know, shopping bags and pins and everything. Uh, it was, she, she was still, like, known, but but not quite the cultural phenomenon that she is right now. <laughs> so it was, it was really refreshing just to learn about her work and, and then feel kind of justified in just going and following my inspiration. I mean, if I wanted to paint myself, I would paint myself. If I, but then my painting myself gradually turned into, I think I, I remember the, the, the drawing that was a transition. It was kind of a, like a sketchbook drawing, like tearing open my sort of chest belly area and all these crows flying out and then at that point I started trying I kind of transitioned to to having that female figure be a doll and not the life life like human like the first doll was that was very large like porcelain kind of head um with the crows flying out and then that just sort of kept going and I, I, I think I kind of masked my self in it and it also then it taking it away from being directly a picture of me um gives me a little more license in in um letting it be a little more universal and not so self-referential and to be more free to to have other things happen to the doll that would feel very different for a very realistic human i mean you know compare the, the doll in blood and string with the uh doll and clothes i don't know if you can see me yes not. Oh, okay 
with Pete Tall in quotes in the in the movie May that came out in the early two thousands. Yeah. Where, yeah, where that doll is like stitched together human remains. So so there's a very different feeling one has looking at the doll in cloth versus the doll in flesh or a, a human person being abused. This is well, the, one of the very first images of the white mice that I painted was them cutting off the breast of a, a very living female figure that looked similar to me, uh, cutting off the breast with very large shears and stitching up her nether region um, with red string. And, you know, that is a much more in your face, not safe for work image. Whereas if it's just like a doll in white fluffy cotton, I mean, what's the, what's the danger? You know, I mean, it's, it's just fabric. I think it, it definitely has, the, it definitely has a different impact. All of the violence is still there, um, but by making it that, I, I, in some ways, it's it's a little more horrifying of an image if it's a doll rather than a person. Um, excellent. Um, <laughs> what what is what is the meaning for you though in terms of um, the tearing, the disembowelment? Is that just part of the female experience for you in terms of? Um, well, it's. There's like the there's like a cutting open. There is a freeing of. So what generally is escaping is kind of a new life, and so it's leaving behind the doll as a husk, as a as a shed skin, as a like a chrysalis. Okay, sure. Or, sure. Yeah. So then something new comes out of it. So well. So spoiler alert for blood stain red string just in case anyone you know watching just does not want a spoiler so so when the little the little bird girl you know burst forth from the doll um new and unexperienced and just like out into the world you know so that is a new birth but like you know as often happens when you escape the nest wound slash whatever chrysalis whatever you're whatever symbolism you're going to use you you go out into the world on your own a little unprepared um the first people who who you know you come in contact with sometimes are very damaging to you and that you know i feel like that 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 spider woman and the the wrapping up of the innocent bird like that that is self-referential but it's not like a direct like this happened on the symbolism of that thing that happened. It's not, it's not that yeah. clear cut and obvious, but you know, it's that kind of snuffing out of the innocence. There's um, also a lot of moral ambiguity to your films. Like you don't necessarily judge what the characters are doing. You know, the mice or the, sorry, for lack of a better term, the rat birds in <laughs> blood tea and red string, they just act and you don't necessarily present that as good or bad. That's what right. does moral ambiguity well, mean to you? Well, I, the characters have a life of their own and I'm not privy to everything that, that they live. I mean, to me, they feel like they have their own independent existence and I get a glimpse of it. And, um, but also I don't tend to see good and evil black and white as as a static a static state you know mm. i mean you know mm. we we often see ourselves as the the protagonist but you know in someone else's eyes are we the protagonist in their story maybe we're not um mm. <laughs> and you know my characters they don't tend to really perceive their actions as evil i mean i call them the evil white mice but they aren't you know specifically i mean they paid for the doll they ordered her she should belong to them i mean it doesn't matter that their money wasn't accepted it's like she's she's theirs and they've been they've been slighted and and and, and then that that that, that they, they don't see themselves as the villains here i mean we don't know where the blood comes from but you know we you know if you're if you're not a vegetarian i mean you have a refund it can you throw stones you know if you're vegetarian then sure you can be totally judgmental and if you're a vegan you are you have license to be extremely judgmental but like if you're not then i mean my strength lied 
Did I lose the tape? <laughs> so they, they seem a little disturbing, but so, I mean, there's a similar moral, similar moral ambiguity in, in, in Seed in the Sand is just, I don't, I don't create ultimate heroes or, you know, ultimate villains. Is like. that an aspect of the pagan imagery in your work as well? I mean, I, I think I've noticed that the, you, you do feature the Wiccan pentagram a lot in your artwork. I mean, does Wiccan culture, pagan culture feed into your films as well? Well, when I, you know, I moved to San Francisco kind of while that that kind of scene is really still, still strong. Um, and you know, learning about other ways of, of, of understanding the universe in a, in a less apocalyptic way, it was really freeing and healing for me. And while I don't necessarily ascribe to specific a specific religion at this point in my life, um, some of the pagan, the pagan remnants, well, I mean, all of them, well, the pagan talking, pagan and that movement, it's all like re religious recreationism as <laughs> in, in the way not being not being a continuous thread as, as like maybe Hinduism being a continuous, a, a potentially a continuous thread for, for like millennia. Um, but just what when you're talking about the pentagram, though, you know, it, it's definitely I see it in in more uh, representing like physical existence um, and life and growth and uh, and people may have may have forgotten that the pentagram was also a symbol used in Christian mythology and there's some and it, it it's definitely taken on takes on a lot of baggage but I definitely see it as a more positive symbol. Um, and it is, you know, yet again in in seed in the sand. You know, the the little nest dwellers. They, for them, and is like the symbol of the of the kind of rebirth in their in their dead, dry, dry meadow. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's got a, a lot of interesting symbolism. In there. Finally, what what does what does string mean for you? What is what is your obsession with string and red string specifically? Um, well, I I've sewn ever since I was very very little, so there's that. Um, the string is then also kind of like the string of life, like the fates. There, um, it is when you have been cut open, you know, the string will sew you back up because it is, it is healing. Um, then, you know, we have the Ariadne string, you know, it also is a path within and a path without. Um, it can take on, it doesn't always really embody all of the things it can symbolize in every single artwork, but, um, mm -hmm. The strongest part is just it being life, living, living. Uh, mm. um, so tying in with that Greek mythology you mentioned, the fates, the idea of the um the string of um destiny, the uh, yeah. yeah, spinning the thread of life. When I look back at the first kind of like impact of red string before I really, well, I mean, I still had the the dolls being sewn up really early in my well young adult or type early um but i saw this movie called the anchors um it came out probably 19 somewhere around 1990 i don't remember when it came out but it's about this it's about an anchor so that is a a, a woman who is uh bricked up into a, a cathedral and and she can't ever leave and the only thing that had color in that movie that was black and white was red string. And something about the aesthetic of that was really impactful. And I, I haven't watched it for many years, so I don't remember exactly, but it, it did, it, re it represented like life and like renewal and it, and that in, in that context of the someone who's having that basically all that's left is a spiritual life because she's walled up in, in a, a church, which was apparently a common thing in medieval Europe. 
I don't know a ton about it. You wall up women in churches. <laughs> yeah, well, this one, and I, 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 I've forgotten. Like I said, I've forgotten a lot, a lot of the elements of that, of that movie. I should watch it again one of these days because I, I know it had an impact. I saw it around, around the similar time period of a Spunkmeyer and movie, and like they just like. Yeah. Those those things you see in your uh, late teens and early twenties tend to stick stick really hard, and because uh, yeah. that's the time you're starting to be creative yourself, so your influences at that moment apparently last your whole life. So. They do, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like slowly going through my <laughs> No, some of them have been surprisingly appropriate. Uh, you, when the doll came up, when you were talking about the dolls, the string yeah. came. So yeah, because I'm also, you know, I'm making a movie, but I also have had two art shows recently where I work. I, I made a lot of, a lot of um, art for them. So this is a fairly recent piece that I made, the sculptural piece. But it is this. There's a sort of feeling I have noticed in the last maybe five years, or maybe version of ten, is a kind of casting off of the doll. So yeah. I feel like I, you know, I'm not sure what's coming next for me whether the doll will continue to be so present and I mean time will tell but I do it and it's happening more in my painting and you know the kind of work I can finish like more quickly <laughs> film <laughs> is is this sort of the the, the rent there's the still doll remnants and the sort of a, a sort of a, a light being kind of a, a escaping from from that and even in this, uh, even in this picture, it's it's like bursting out of a, I'm not, I'm, you know, a fabric of some sort. There's cotton, uh, cotton around. So the, I guess the doll is present there. And uh, the, in the next one, the uh, mask, the doll-like porcelain mask, is cast off. So, yeah, it's all the same. It's actually the same piece. It's a sculpt. It's kind of a long sculpture. Um, so, so that that character's on that character's on one end, and the mask is has been thrown off by her from another angle. It, it has a little more of a watery, a watery look, because I've got you know sort of star fields. This is from Seed in the Sand, the still image, and so the the dreams tend to have a star field in the back. They... Gorgeous. All right, I'm you know this is. Uh... This has been uh, so fantastic. Actually, this is a lot more than I expected. But I, I just thought we'd talk. I didn't know we were going to get um, a treat of uh, of getting to see all this work and talk about it too. Um, but that's fantastic. And so uh, we are almost out of time. Um, we have like three more minutes if you want to say anything else. Uh, but like I say, I've, I've, I'm kind of blown away. I did not expect all this. It's really <laughs> great, great stuff. And I hope uh, Thank you. we're going to increase your awareness and get you some new Patreon subscribers because yeah. you really deserve to get this done. Anything, any I final thoughts? Better. Yeah, I speak better in images. So that's where the image is. <laughs> Once I get the images going, I'm like, um, well, I, I have, you can find Blood Tea and Red String on Instagram. There's a Blood Tea and Red String Instagram account that you can go check out. And there is a Seed in the Sand Instagram you can check out. Um, Blood Tea and Red String.com, Seed in the Sand.com. It will take you to all of the, all of the things that you can access um, the behind the scenes things on the seed in the sand we're, we're giving blood teen red strings instagram a little more love right now than seed in the sand because we're like we're like we can't give away too much of the movies we're kind of like been build it building that up there are well this will soon be the past but right now there are screenings of blood teen red string at alamo draft house new york san francisco and los angeles um on november 7th through ninth depending on which place you are living there are still a few seats left they are selling out fairly quickly we ate, we had one screening in each location but all those sold out so now we have more which was very exciting to see for a 17 year old movie that is um really fun 
Excellent. It's having a revival right now. We will link all of that stuff uh, in various places, both on the blog and on the YouTube, uh, where you may be watching this. Uh, so check below if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, I, thanks so much, Brian. Any final words in the last two minutes? Uh, no, um, just thank you, Christian, for sharing all of that, particularly about the um, the sim the symbology and yeah, uh, the deeper meaning behind your work, which is always fascinating to me. Just you know, uh, seeing the artist's psyche on screen. So. <laughs> well, thanks for drawing it out. It's been really fun talking to you guys, and thank you for inviting me to your show. Oh, thanks. Get it. Hopefully we can have you back maybe after Seed in the Sand is ready. Um, thanks everybody. We gotta go. We gotta leave. That was uh, that was fantastic. I had a great time. Thanks, Christiane. Thanks, Brian. And see you next week. <laughs>